science facts. And here's a map that NASA put out which shows the results of over 6,000 weather stations across the globe and how temperature has changed since the early part of the 20th century um, through the present. And so you can see from this pattern, there's a very distinct uh, movement of change here. Um, I show this to my nine-year-old, and it's very, very clear even to him what is going on in the world. As you can see, as we went through the last few decades here, not only is it getting warmer, it's getting more and more rapidly. And again, we're talking about 6,000 weather stations that are accumulated and integrated to get to this result. So we're not, these are not just one-off studies. I would suggest this is probably one of the most robust scientific experiments that's ever been done. And you see the result. And here it is simplified from a NOAA plot showing the change in temperature um, over the last 130 years or so. Again, I show this to middle schoolers, elementary school folks. These kids get it. This is very simple. And, and uh, moving on through high school and Sydney, your talk was really inspiring and tough act to follow. And I'm really excited about your generation, the prospects for how we're going to deal with this issue. Um, but I'm going to talk uh, more from now the body of knowledge that we've accumulated in our older generation and hopefully ways that the younger generation can help us uh, move the needle on this. So a few climate factoids. Um, we see the, this information um, accumulated from hundreds of scientists from across the world. And still there's lots of pushback. Lots of pushback from the denier community. And they have been successful by repeating the same message over and over and over again. And this has been true for many scientific discoveries over the last century and our understanding of health and the environment um, from lung cancer to global warming to the ozone hole. You know, the success of, that has really suppressed the scientific acceptance of, of certain of these really, you know, very, very robust facts is just the repeating of these same messages over and over and over again. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. And I think we found that science, scientists have to speak out much, much more than they have in the past. And that's become an heir apparent in the last couple of years in particular. So, one of the things we often hear is, well, the climate's always been changing. Okay? Um, this is just a blip in, in, you know, our whole geologic history. So, you know, this is not our fault. Well, we know from Geo 101, if you remember Milankovitch cycles, this is how the Earth's orbit varies around the sun over predictable um, periodicities of 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 years, um, that this has led to very long-term cooling and warming cycles in Earth's history. However, we should actually be cooling right now, um, according to these geological cycles, okay? We're not cooling. Also, the other, one of the other arguments is that, well, solar activity varies on decadal, multi-decadal time scales, and so we're just in this period where the sun is, is putting out a little bit more heat. But in fact, there hasn't been any increase in solar activity in the last 65 years, and we've had three of the warmest years on record. Um, and then, say, so, well, you know, things are still are always changing, um, however, um, the temperature increase over the last century is 50 times faster than any time in the last 20,000 years. So it's undeniable that we are affecting the climate in catastrophic ways right now. Okay, so why do we care about this if we live along the coast? Well, global temperature has been linked to sea level rise by many, many studies. The most landmark one was by Stefan Ramsdorf in 2007. Um, and why we start to care about this is, you know, we are blasting right through this Paris target on track um, to blast through this Paris target one and a half degrees above pre-industrial. We're at one degree right now. Um, there's no signs of slowing down. We're going to hit this Paris target probably around 2030 or so. Um, the whole idea of the Paris Accord was to, was to stabilize temperatures around one and a half degrees and keep them below two degrees. So why do we care about this? Well, we know from the recent geological past that uh, two degrees Celsius warmer than today equals about eight meters of sea level rise. That's about 25 feet. So once the whole ocean system equilibrates this level of temperature increase, we're going to get sea level rise that's about 25 feet higher than it is today. This could take centuries. However, we will eventually get there. So let's keep temperatures as low as we can. We also know that in the very recent past that there have been episodes with much, much less warming. For example, during this meltwater pulse, pulse 1A, 
14,000 years ago, we had multimeter sea level rise in a century. In fact, we had four centuries in a row with five meters of sea level rise. So less than 100 years, five meters of sea level rise, about 16 feet. So we know it can happen, and we're still trying to understand um, the interaction of ice sheet dynamics and the ocean and sea level rise um, uh, better today. So these are causes for major concern moving forward. And there's a very recent paper that came out just a few weeks ago. It was highlighted in CNN. It was highlighted in the New York Times, and I believe the Wall Street Journal as well, um, by Bamber et al. And actually, Bob Kopp was, uh, I think this is his student, and uh, Bob Kopp is the one who helped generate the most recent sea level rise guidance for the state of California. Okay, the take home message here, and this is what we've been seeing more consistently across the scientific literature, is that two meters of sea level rise, or about six and a half feet, is now within our confidence bands as the worst case scenario. Used to be about a decade ago, we thought two meters was the absolute maximum that was physically tenable based on our understanding of ice sheets. Now this two meters is, is becoming, it's right sort of in a sweet spot of what we think is, is possible um, and not an extreme <laughs> unlikely scenario. This is because we know so much more about ice sheets we know so much more about Antarctica than we did about a decade ago and about Greenland. And also our observations of these ice sheets have suggested a re more rapid melting and more rapid contribution to sea level rise since the last assessment of IPCC. Okay, and this paper ends by saying a sea level rise of this magnitude would clearly have profound consequences for humanity, which I think goes unsaid. And the reason for this is, we're going to talk about it in a second, but how does this relate to the most recent projections for California specifically, not just global rates, okay? So this is guidance that came out um, through the state, and the most likely range by 2100 is about 30 to 110 centimeters, so about, about 1 to 4 feet. Um, the upper bound with a, just a 0.1% chance is placed at 3 meters, but the state is asking communities to consider this extreme um, sea level rise case in their planning. Um, but we know sea level rise is not all that we care about. It's not a bathtub out there. There are waves. Um, there have been a couple of studies that we've done, that Scripps has done, looking at the future wave climate. And that's actually not expected to change a whole lot for California. So that's the good news. We may have a little more waves out of the south. Uh, so if you have more southern facing beaches, they may be more exposed in the future. Um, but in general, not, not big changes. Um, El Nino is less certain. Um, the most recent science suggests more frequent extreme El Nino events, and when we do have these extreme events, we tend to double our winter erosion. Um, we, wave energy increases by up to 50%, but on average about 30%. So we have winters that are more destructive for the coast. But the bottom line is that with even just a little bit of sea level rise, even by, um, let's say 2050, the 100 year event, is going to occur every one to five years. This is because we live in like a very narrow band of extreme values on this coast. So if the corollary, or the opposite of that is you look at the Gulf Coast, where you can have hurricanes that can increase water levels by 10 or 20 or 30 feet. Uh, we just have storm surge here is about three feet or so during extreme events. So we have a very, very narrow band of our extreme water levels here. So just a little bit more sea level rise puts us in a whole different category. Okay, so why do we care about this? Over a billion people are going to live in the coastal zone um, by mid-century. Right now there's 700 million people globally that live in the coastal zone. In California we have 27 million people living in coastal counties. And the work that we've done across California, looking at the, at the confluence of sea level rise and storms, suggests that over half a million people will be exposed to flooding in the next century and over $150 billion in property at risk. If you consider inflation, that number becomes $1 trillion by the end of the century. Now, San Mateo, sadly, is really ground zero for climate change in the United States, along with several other counties, but it's only one of a few counties out of over 300 where over 100,000 residents could be at risk of permanent flooding with just about three feet of sea level rise. And the reason for this is fairly obvious. We built out into the bay shoreline. We're surrounded by levees, not only in Foster City here, but in many other locations um, along San Mateo Canyon throughout San Francisco Bay. So in fact, when we've looked at these numbers across the state, San Francisco Bay accounts for two thirds of the statewide impacts from sea level rise and storms. 
Okay, so what have we done about this? Well, there's a couple different approaches. One is a very simple bathtub approach where you simply look at the tides, you look at sea level rise, and you see what gets flooded. And this is a really nice approach for looking at the daily impacts of sea level rise. What's it going to look like every single day in your backyard? Um, however, it's going to underpredict flooding hazards because we're not considering storms in this analysis. And this is a, an example here from Foster City, which I'm going to pick on a lot more here now for a change, so it's actually fitting. Um, if you look at tw just 25 centimeters of sea level rise, this whole this sort of peninsula here is vulnerable to flooding, but because of levees, it's protected. So we see in green here, it just means it's actually below the flood elevation, but it's not, but it's being protected by flood control structures. <laughs> I'm up, that's not good. Okay. <laughs> Um, but if you then add a storm to this, to this uh, scenario, this is the situation for Foster City. So storms matter, we have to consider them when we look um, at future impacts. And that's because El Nino raises water levels, storm surge raises water levels, river discharge can raise water levels locally, and on the outer coast in particular, waves can raise water levels. So we developed a model called COSMOS, the Coastal Storm Modeling System, to consider all the different physics involved in water levels along the coast, supported by the state and the feds. And the idea was to build a consistent, seamless coastal flood hazard set of scenarios for the entire state of California. Okay. So this is what we've done. It's been done for the, uh, much of the state already. San Francisco Bay was done several years ago. The Central Coast is wrapping up right now. Southern California was done a couple years back, and we're just about to move to the North Coast. But the idea was to present scenarios for the full range of possible um, outcomes from sea level rise to, from starting today to tomorrow's most extreme sea level rise and severe storm. So this is how the model works. We take the global climate models, the latest and greatest from IPCC, we then, down, then we uh, feed this into global wave models, and then ultimately downscale to the regional level, the local level. So we go from 100 kilometer scale forcing down to two meter scale. So about every six feet or so, uh, we have a prediction of flooding for every one of these different 40 scenarios. And then we couple this with several different tools, which you can interact with. I'll show you those in a second for looking at flooding and also the socioeconomic impact. So what's actually in the flood zone? Why do we care? So this is just an example from our area right here. And I've just uh, highlighted Oracle. Uh, obviously, tech is a big issue in this region. And so this is the Our Coast, Our Future tool. Anyone can use it. It's a Google Earth interface. You can zoom in, zoom out to your area of expertise. Choose whatever sea level rise scenario you want, whatever storm scenario you want. And what folks often do is they zoom in, like an area like here in San Mateo County, and start clicking through scenarios to see maybe where their tipping points are. You can see there's a very distinct one for Foster City with just about half a meter of sea level rise just beyond 2050. And then as you click through more and more scenarios, more and more sea level rise and storms, you see what, what the future looks like if we do nothing. So this is the do nothing approach. This is we all walk away and just put our heads in the sand and, and assume that nothing's going to happen. This is what could happen to this particular area. We also have predictions of shoreline change. These are available now. So this looks at how the beaches will erode through time as sea level rises over the, over the coming decades. This is just an example from Pacifica. And then we also have some models we developed for looking at cliff retreat and where the cliff edge is going to be in the future. And this is an example from Pillar Point. OK, I'll try to wrap up, not to take too much time more, sorry. Okay, so, but, we, but often you see a map like this, and it could be a little bit um, daunting, but what does it really mean? And so, we developed this tool for looking at the socioeconomic impacts, and that's what this is here. So now we can translate these 2D flood maps into something that's actually meaningful to uh, perhaps our supervisors and others, although so these are two of the most informed supervisors you're ever going to find in the state. Um, but we can take this kind of thing to the governor's office and say, okay, well, half a meter of sea level rise in a storm, that means 100,000 residents are at risk. Or two meters of sea level rise in a 100-year storm, that's $26 billion in property. You know, that's 100, over 100 critical facilities, schools, police stations, hospitals. So it's a better way for some people to wrap their heads around really the scale of the, of the issue. Um, lastly... We just talked about overland flooding, but there's also this kind of hidden danger in terms of groundwater. So along the coast, the groundwater table is very, very shallow. It has to because water flows to the ocean. 
Um, but then if you raise um, sea level, the water table is going to go up as well. So there's actually some areas where the water table is going to start to intercept the surface before you even have significant overland flooding. And this is just a very crude example here from this region showing areas that are actually below, um, or actually, sorry, where land is, it could potentially be inundated by the water table intercepting the surface. Um, and so this can obviously cause major problems. There's pumping in lots of areas we know throughout the state of California. And so what we've done is develop a more sophisticated modeling approach to look at how the water table will respond to sea level rise. And this is just a map showing the depth to the water table for San Mateo County. Um, the red is where the water table is predicted to actually emerge at the surface, or is very, very shallow. And if you click through scenarios, and then you start to see how the water table will respond, and it's quite subtle. And in areas like this, where you have pretty well-developed drainage pathways, the water table isn't going to rise at the same rate as sea level rise. However, shallow water is, a, a subsurface is a, definitely a hazard and something that needs to be considered as well. And this kind of brings up the point of, well, what about groundwater? Most of the more common strategies for dealing with overland flooding deal with managed retreat. You know, you're blocking the ocean, you're getting out of the way, elevating, or you're restoring in some fashion, but this isn't going to work for groundwater, and Miami is case in point for that at the global stage. Okay. Thank you for letting me go over, and uh, I think we're going to share these slides so if they went too fast, people are welcome to check them out and get back to me. We're wrapping up coastal change work for all Central Coast. The Bay Side has been done for years. The Outer Coast will be done in just a couple of months with all these tools I talked about along with the groundwater work. So thank you so much for your time.